Okay, everyone, welcome to the uh, Q&A for the amazing documentary Rebel Hearts, uh, which recently had its world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival and is now having its East Coast premiere uh, with the Miami Film Festival. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome our guest, uh, Pedro Coase, who's a, a hometown hero. He grew up in Miami. Um, this is his second documentary feature after 2017's Bending the Arc. He's also edited a, a large number of uh, documentaries, including Wasteland and The Square, both of which were nominated for Academy Awards. Pedro, welcome. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here. Well, virtually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, congratulations on this, uh, this beautiful film, which manages to be inspiring, heartbreaking, joyful, all at the same time. Um, one of the things that I love is that you managed to capture a very particular time, the, the, the late 60s in which the main events take place, but it's also a very timeless film. Uh, I think of the insight, um, you know, if, if you don't fit in, you're not a prophet, right? Uh, that's so beautifully said uh, and is always true. And the fight for the fight for uh, equality, which which is always going on. Um, what kind of reactions have people been having to the film since the Sundance premiere? Um, what are they taking from it? What do you want people to take from the film? Um, it it it's actually been uh, extraordinary in the way that the reactions that we've been getting because it is ev ev everything we had dreamed of in in terms of. Even though this is a, as, as you said, it's a, a film set in the 60s of over, you know, 50 years ago, but people are, everyone is really sort of seeing it as a timeless and also a very current film, a very current story about being a part of the world and, um, you know, empowering one another to create change and the power of community. And when we were making it, it was always very much a film about today and who we are today. And kind of waking up to these oppressive structures that, you know, that govern our lives in one way or another. And, um, and kind of gathering to, you know, coming together as community to create change. And I think that's what we've been, we, we, we saw so much last year in 2020 um, and, and what we continue to see. And I think um, as um, Pat Reef at the end of the film says, is, you know, it's, for them, it was very much um, uh, sort of empowering, you know, one another uh, as as women in a time that women were very oppressed and were not um, did not have a voice. But um, but Pat Reef, who was you know one of the extraordinary minds of the Immaculate Heart, saw it beyond that issue. So it's not just a gender issue; it's about all sorts of oppression. Um, and sort of really waking up and then coming really together. So I think that the power of, you know, the power of, we've, we've heard this before, power of a concerted individuals who, who try to create change and really go out and do it. That's beautiful, beautifully said and, and beautifully uh, expressed in the film. Um, I, I imagine you had a big challenge at the outset, right? Because you, you wanted to take us to this, the, the kind of seminal moments there in the late 60s and make us kind of live through them. But some of the main uh, protagonists, I'm thinking of, of Sister Anita and Sister Corita, had, had already passed on. Um, how did you, tell us about your process, how you uh, went about trying to kind of put us in their heads and, and, and make us relive those moments, uh, you know, searching for footage, et cetera. Absolutely. It was, it, and that was, you know, definitely a, a big challenge on the offset. Uh, we, you know, when I, when I came on board the project to, um, to direct it, it was a, a, a dear friend and colleague, Kier Carstensen, who had um, connected with this other really extraordinary filmmaker, Shawnee Isaac Smith, who actually began documenting these women um, over 20 years ago in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, she began interviewing um, sister, you know, Anita and Pat Reef and Helen Kelly when these extraordinary women were alive and well. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them are no longer with us. And, and actually, that's quite bittersweet for us in a way, um, because I think we, we, we so wanted them to be sort of to live this moment. Um, but, uh, but they, were, they, they guide us every day. And Shawnee docu got this huge treasure tro trove, uh, um, interviewed, you know, so many of these extraordinary women had an extraordinary treasure trove. So much of it is in the in the cutting room floor. We have like almost fifty interviews, um, and um, and so these first hand accounts were really sort of the foundation what of what became Werbel Hearts. Um, and then from that, you know, 
Shawnee had already amassed some of um, some archival material, and then we began digging for more. And I began also filming. Um, I think it was 2017 when I began filming, um, and really to ground it in the present, in, a, in sort of in the present day, and with the current movements and with the characters um, where they are today. And um, and in that sort of big effort to amass, you know, it's always a treasure trove on our, you know, it's, it always feels like a treasure trove hunt on archival films. You know, you're always like digging for more. It's like, where did that footage come from? And that clip came from where? And there's a lot of digging and it actually takes many, 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 many months. And, you know, uh, archival producer, our amazing Gabriella Ricketts, just like, you know, looking in every nook and cranny from the, our, you know, the major broadcasters to like NBC. We have a lot of NBC footage, a lot of BBC footage, ABC, to also, you know, filmmakers who were documenting at the time um, and to documents. I mean, I think that's the, the other thing. It's like you, there's a lot of written material from that time. You know, maybe there wasn't uh, a camera capturing something, but there was um, it may be audio as we hear on the film or maybe um, notes or some. So in the way it was like, how do we take all that disparate material, right? You know, from letters to notes, to audio, to footage and really kind of bring it into one cohesive um, film and story. And, you know, I, with my amazing producer, uh, Judy Korn, we started talking about animation and how to capture the zeitgeist and the, the spirit, right, of what they were doing in a visually um, exciting manner that also feels really organic to the story. And that really was, well, we, we kept asking ourselves, what would Karita do, right, uh, Karita Kent? And so we, we began, I began, you know, playing with the idea of animation. And then Judy had worked with um, the amazing Una Lawrence and the uh, Icelandic animator based in Montreal. And when I saw her work, I was like, oh my God, yes, th this is it. This is what uh, could, could, you know, could really be a, a beautiful, um, you know, collaboration. And uh, I, when I connected with Una, we showed her Karita's art and really kind of talked about, the animation being feel, feeling really tactile, you know, like you yeah. almost feel the texture of that paper. Um, that's, and yeah, that's amazing. And, and, and you actually, you transitioned perfectly into my next question. I was gonna ask you about the animation. Um, the, the, it's so visually expressive. And I, I mean, I think of some of the early sequences where the nuns kind of seem like these, these faceless cogs in an industrial machine, just kind of mm -hmm. doing the Cardinal's will, uh, all very anonymous. Yes. Um, what, what, so what kind of conversations did, did you have about um, how, what you wanted each sequence to say and, and express visually? Absolutely. Um, we, you know, first it was so the initial, the initial conversations were more, more, you know, about like kind of the texture and sort of like taking cue from Karita's art in, art in terms of the layering and all that. And then and then I wanted the animation to have an arc. I love that you picked up on those, you know, at first they seemed faceless, anonymous, um, doing the Cardinal's bidding. Um, and then as slowly evolves, it's kind of like the development, the, you know, this awakening and development of consciousness and, uh, and free will and really kind of taking power in their own hands. And by the end, the animation is more, um, you see features, you know, like that we, there was a very, concerted progression in sort of how the women are depicted in the animation from sort of like faceless, um, uh, you know, almost like part of a, a bouquet of nuns, as I used to call it, uh, to something that's more um, character based, that's more expressive, that's more, um, Con th th there is a, you know, a beautiful consciousness be uh, behind it. Um, and that to the you know the the first animation is and it's also it's this kind of the story of the, the uh, of a marriage of a relationship right they get married in the first animation they get married to to the church uh and at the end is when they dispense from their vows you know sort of the divorce of it all um and you know it's it's, it's a I, I used to joke we like this is this you know a marriage story but in you know uh, <laughs> uh 
but differently. And so for then each one, each sequence, you know, how that fit within that sort of arc, you know, sure. um, and really talking about how they would begin to come to life, especially in the like along comes, you know, like you, you see them downtrodden and then like they really begin to kind of like taking, you know, the power and uh, into their own hands and sort yeah. of like, um, so yeah, so that was sort of the overall arc and with, you know, how it played in each individual one. We kind of well, it's, it's brilliantly executed. Congra congratulations on that. It's, it's, it's very cohesive and, and expressive and beautiful. Um, what, so one of the, one of the many things that moved me about this is, is when, you know, the, the stories, when you think of, at least when I think of nuns, I think of kind of a very cloistered existence kind of cut off from the struggles of the world. And what's, what's inspiring about these women is how much they rejected that. I mean, you know, sometimes even risking their lives to join the struggle in, in Selma, for example. Um, and I can't help but think of, of bending the arc also and, and the doctors who, who, you know, went to Haiti could have, could have gone another path, an easier path. Are you drawn to kind of these kind of stories in particular, people who kind of reject uh, an easy path to kind of try to make make the world better, even at, at their own personal expense sometimes? Absolutely. I mean, y yes, I think uh, it's interesting how, uh, yeah, the, the films that I've, I've made and been involved with uh, kind of really tap into that theme. I think, yes, I mean, I think that's something that was really um, ingrained into me um, by, you know, by my family, by my parents, my, I come from, actually I come from a family of doctors, of Brazilian doctors, um, and um, who were very, very social justice um, driven and minded. And um, there was always, you know, I was always taught that. And, and in, in a way that was tied to, to, to our faith. Yeah. And, and I, and I, uh, you know, it's interesting because, I, as I say, the, the 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 battle lines between the conservative and and progressive parts of Catholicism like run right through me. It's because yes, I had that experience on different sides of the family with very different outlooks and interpretations of that faith. And then um, on my father's side, the doctor side was very progressive, very social, you know, social justice minded. And I think that's something that really that really stayed, you know, uh, about. Um, doing you know when you take an oath as a doctor you know you, it's you know to do no harm and to like you know to heal um and i'm not a doctor uh you know and my mother still holds that over my head every day um but uh i i she still says well you know you can still go to medical school um but uh, uh but it's it's definitely i think that the you know, the philosophy behind it, it's something that's definitely stayed with me and it's something that I really, um, I feel really strongly about. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's very inspiring, very inspiring. Um, uh, another thing that moved me, and, and I, I did not expect the story to go there, um, is the fact that after uh, these nuns are forced to leave the church, um, you, you think it would be so natural for them to kind of all go their own ways and, and you know, some did. Uh, I just agreed to move, move to Boston uh, to pursue her art, but a, a remarkable number just kind of blazed ahead and made their own community. And not only that, uh, managed to sustain it for for fifty years. Mm -hmm. um, how did they do that? I mean, uh, you know, how, how did they manage to be so cohesive? What, what did you observe in the time that you that you spent with them? Uh, it, it just seems remarkable, miraculous, almost. Yeah, um, it. it it is miraculous and uh, extraordinary. And I think it really is a testament to, um, to the power and that they had as a, as a group and as a community, the cohesiveness. I think what, one of the things is that um, they, what they were fighting for um, and what they were kind of really fervently believed is that in order to, um, you know, live, live their faith that they're called to do, uh, to, um, you know, to do the works that they are called to do, they, you know, one had to empower one another, had to lift one another up. And I think that's, um, 
as a community, they were, Sister Corita became the icon of pop art because of this community of women who were educating and sending. They had more PhDs and advanced degrees than all the priests in Los Angeles combined. Um, they were the one of the most well-educated order of nuns in, in the world at that point. I mean, they Anita had a PhD in literature from Stanford. Um, Lenore, who you meet, has an MFA in film from Columbia University. I mean, and the, and the list goes on and on and on, like whether they were, um, they felt really strongly about the power and the value of education. Um, and in order to, uh, you know, make them at the best teachers that they could be to, to re so that they can empower their students, but also one another. Um, and that I think is one of the things why you see the, uh, one of the main reasons why you see the, the Immaculate Heart community stay really strong despite all the challenges that, that, that they have faced over yeah. 50 years. And that's why they're continuing to um, bring on new members. I mean, and now it's, you know, only, less than half of the communities are from, you know, the original ones from the pre-1970. Um, and I think that spirit of um, empowering one another, respecting the, each one's individual calling for a greater group of shared values. I think yeah. that that's the thing you can be a part of, you know, I'm, um, what I observed and what, you know, what I still observe is that they um, can pursue their own works, um, but be a part of a community that is there to empower them, to lift them up and to um, guide whenever you need guidance. You know, like it's, it's, really, um, it's really kind of inspiring to see a community of faith uh, a different kind of community of faith uh, exists in the world today, um, and uh, and the most the most beautiful thing was actually seeing the the uh, community of the, the 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 retired women, you know, who were living together. And that was, I have to say, it was one of the, the the great gifts in my life so far is to be able to to be in their presence and to film with them and. Uh, uh, the joy and the, their spirit is palpable, and uh, yeah, we are all really transformed. Um, that's that. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, so we talked a little bit about you know the conversations you had going into the animation. The music in this film is amazing. Like I, I absolutely love the soundtrack. Um, what what were some what was some of the thinking you had on that? What was your what was your process to select the music or work with someone in selecting the music? Uh, absolutely, uh, both. You know, we have. Um, you know, worked, I was, we were extraordinarily blessed to work with two incredible geniuses on the music front, Tracy McKnight, the legendary music supervisor who uh, has, you know, has just done the, you know, the, the biggest and the best films um, and also was really inspired by the story and was just a, an, an incredible, you know, supporter and early, you know, came on board pretty early on in the project and, um, and Tracy and I, I mean, like I, I said, Tracy, you just make dreams come, come, come true. I mean, because it was like, oh, I never thought we would get Nina Simone. I never thought we would get Petty Smith. I never thought we would get the associate. I mean, like these are just like, oh, I love this song. I, I'm, you know, resigned to the fact I'm going to have to replace it. But but no, but Tracy it coming in for, the, you know, the, you know, like, no, she's like, she made all our dreams come true. Uh, and it was awesome because, you know, she, I think, being inspired by the story went went to you know and it was wonderful to see like the Nina Simone's estate being inspired by the story too and you know everyone that she reached out to was really equally um you know game to you know to um to, to have the music part be part of this uh, story um and then Tracy um uh you know when we were looking for composers Tracy was like well you should look at this uh extraordinary young composer, Ariel Marx. Um, you know, she's up and coming. She did um, Jennifer, Fo Jennifer Fox's Tale and um, I think this, the Ted Bundy docuseries on Amazon. And when I heard and had just, was releasing an album at that time, her first um, album, Luth Luthier. Um, and when I heard that, I was blown away. And I was blown, and I, and I started, 
I was blown away by her body of work, um, her the expressiveness, and also the range. And that's the something that this film really called because this is such a like a, a, a clash of the you know the the rigidity of the Catholic Catholic Church to sort of a very more open and free form, um, magical in a sense, uh, musical landscape, it required a, like a very large range. And Ariel it not only had that in spades, but I think was, uh, it, that was such a beautiful collaboration that we had. And it was, um, it was actually very magical for, um, for many reasons, because it became, once Ariel started to do, um, started to work on it, it actually kind of informed how we were editing and cutting and there was a beautiful back and forth um and uh yeah i'm just so like um so through the moon and you know ariel marx is just a, a, a musical genius to to um to put it mildly so absolutely well uh gosh i had so many more questions but but uh we're out of time unfortunately um but thank you so much for for sharing this film with with our audience and for uh participating in this Q&A. Uh, we're, we're, we're so grateful both uh, to have seen this wonderful film and, uh, and for your insights. Thank you, Pedro. So honored to be here. Thank you, Nick.